But that also um, triggered me because Weeks is an old family name in my family. So I thought I would actually would start back with the uh, ancestral herbal stuff. And uh, I know Ju- um, Judith, no, she's Phyllis. <laughs> hey, I, but she, Judith is so awesome. I don't mind. Right, right. <laughs> so um, uh, Phyllis has many uh, genealogical stories, too, or um, family origin um, when she was a little girl learning how to pick herbs and stuff like that. So so um, my my tradition is not as uh, well. Nobody was trying to be an herbalist for the last couple of generations. My my uh, great grandmother was what they call a green picker. They probably use that term. That was Kansas. They probably use that term further south as well. So every spring she picked greens and um that's what they ate and um also that's medicine because um in the old days um you know spring fever we call oh let's go buy a bunch of stuff spring fever or you know or geez uh, uh, all the girls are wearing shorter pants now and stuff <laughs> spring fever and uh, <laughs> and up there in minnesota boy you sure notice that but spring fever originally meant that you were getting sick because you were transitioning too quickly to vegetables and from salted pork and various things that lasted through the winter time. So you had to take your spring greens to slowly acclimatize yourself to the, um, to the different um, sort of um, diet. And a lot of them were bitters. And my aunt Pat said, uh, said, I only knew 16 uh, greens, but, but your your great grandmother, she knew twenty four. It was an awful lot. She said that's a pretty hard number. The only thing I remember from Aunt Pat telling me is that um, chickweed makes the other bitters less bitter. Is do you know? Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, it's a little mucilaginous and neutral in taste, so it kind of it's yeah. a little salty to neutral. Yeah, but yeah. it would make bitter less bitter. Yeah. yeah. So then, however, then on my my uh, father's father's side, that was my grandmother's side, and they were kind of southerners, so you know they southern Kansas, so they'd have a little bit common more with uh, your tradition there. But up there in New in uh, New York on Long Island um, on Oyster Bay, where I'm descended from the Weeks family of that particular. I don't know if that's your family, Diana, but. Um, that's the family I'm descended from five or six times over because they all intermarried all those Quakers. And, uh, and so um, they were, uh, so one day I was, I'll have to post a picture of this. Um, I wanted a copy of a book called uh, William Buchan's um, Domestic Medicine, which is the manual that most people would have used in the American colonies just at the time of the revolution, a little bit before all the way into the 1800s before Samuel Thompson really took off with those books. And so I've been a bibliophile. I want to get this uh, uh, Buchan's um, book. And um, so I looked for all the editions that were under $100 um, and published in the 18th century rather than the 19th. I thought, yeah, I want that. So I ordered this copy and it came and I, I opened up, I opened it up and it said uh, Edmund Pryor, Oyster Bay, his book. And then it said Thomas Pearsall, his book. And then there was a different Thomas Pearsall as well. It was like, oh, my God, I immediately recognized that was my great, great, great grandmother's uncles and uh, several uncles. And um, so this is 1779. And Edmund Pryor, yeah, I'm not descended from him. He'd married one of the sisters that Thomas Paul, Thomas Pearsall um uh was um one of the other ones so so this was the herbal that my family used in like 1780 90 1800 like that on long island there and there was a couple recipes written in one for um one involving frost weed or scruff you let's see what's that called it's helianthemum it's a rock rose um Geez, it's a really obscure plant, but it grows commonly on the on the um, Hempstead Plains there on the plains of New York, and that's where that's where they were picking herbs. So, so that was pretty cool to get an old family herbal back like that. <laughs> yeah. I bet, I bet. It happen all the time. Yeah. Uh, 
So um, I guess I could talk about my cousin, Calvin. I don't think I've talked about him before, but you met him. You came right. and we went over to his dance barn and, yep. and yeah, that, <laughs> at his barber shop. Remember, <laughs> do you remember that? So, so um, my cousin Calvin, Calvin Ralph, um, was um, English, part English and uh, Cherokee. And his great great grandfather had actually been one of the signers of the great, no, his grandfather's grandfather had actually been one of the signers um, the, of the treaty the Cherokee made prior to the to the trail of tears and that was he was always embarrassed by that <laughs> but, but yeah. uh, Those, that was their hands were forced but um yeah that was a terrible um yeah situation and those guys were hated and, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah so um anyway my cousin calvin he was a gentleman's herbalist and he lived way out in the country and uh, his setup was he and his wife had their house and their kids were grown uh, when Matthew came over to visit. And then he had his barber shop and he did the old um, tradition of of herbalist for men and offered his barber shop in the middle of nowhere, literally kind of in the middle of nowhere, Countryville. Um, for men to come in in the community and sit around and while he worked on somebody's hair and uh, talk about their health problems, and then they would leave with herbs. And um, he, he and his wife also had connected to the barbershop. Behind the barbershop was an old barn that they had turned into a dance barn. And on Saturday nights when the weather was nice, because you had to have the doors open and the barn leaked like crazy. The absolute worst country band ever couldn't get a job anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible would come and play for whatever the door admission was. And he charged by the car load, like $20 a car load or $5 a person. And he would put plywood, big sheets of plywood on the, the ground. And this is where you danced. And right. And all behind and all behind this house, but behind the barn, behind the barbershop was probably, I'm going to say about 25 acres of woods where he gathered the herbs that he dried and made into little baggies because he did the traditional method of teas and decoctions. And then, you know, the men in the community would come in and see him and he would see women too, but it, this was kind of a, a men's haven, a guy's place. And they could come in there to his barbershop and just talk about anything they wanted to talk about and feel perfectly safe. And if they, if there was a lull in the conversation, he told stories about people's Native Americans and are about, talked about plants. And so I, I could go over only ever so often. And the men got used to seeing me come over and sit. And they would, after a while, they would still talk in front of me because the first few times I went over and I was sitting there, they were like a little shy and didn't want to discuss their problems. Um, but after I'd been there two or three times and my cousin Calvin was saying, no, I'm I'm learning her herbs. Um, they, they, they relaxed and I was able to hear their stories and watch how he did herbalism. And um, he never charged for his consultations, but he did charge for his gathering and drying and taking care of the herbs. And um, he's also the family member that would tell me stories about my grandmother's uh, herbal and midwifery days from the 1900s, way before I was born. He would also tell me stories about her and kept uh, and how she had actually helped teach him because he was younger than my grandmother and how his grandfather had also taught him and his grandfather had taught him to identify trees in the woods um, through speak Cherokee songs. 
So there was a song for every tree and what it did. And, and he um, probably about a year before cousin Calvin died, um, he um, said, you know, I had a dream that I should teach you these songs. And I was like, cool. Cause I've been like begging, begging for years. Please teach me this. Please teach me this. But he had two sons and he kept thinking one of his sons would want to be an herbalist. And then he, uh-huh. no, they did not want to be an herbalist. And um, so I, finally he said, uh, our, he said, I had a dream I should teach you. And I was like, cool. I mean, cause he had been sharing herbal information with me, but I wanted to learn those songs. And we had like two sessions um, out in the woods and he got sick and he couldn't teach me anymore. So I never really learned um, the words, but the feeling that went with it, the songs is kind of not describable. It was pretty amazing just to be in the woods and to touch a tree and to hear him sing the songs. It was, it was like, an amazing, awesome. I can't even explain the energy that you could feel with that kind of ritual. And I was always sorry I didn't learn um, those songs, but you know, that's the way the dice rolled on that one. <laughs> you know, it's like he kind of held out to you, it was almost too late. So I really miss him. I really do miss him. And um, in the town where I live, there is a um, museum. <laughs> Um, which is actually on the natural national registry called the, the Elvin Light Museum. Uh, so this is a museum that members of my family put together and it's full of um, old tools and old um, like medicine bottles and in just old stuff, right? That they gather. And I went touring there Oh, about six months ago, because I hadn't been in a long time. And there was a a big picture in newspaper article of Calvin. And he loved to wear when he did his talks, because he did talks all over the southeast. And he wore a bowler hat that sometimes you see Native record with an eagle feather in it. And that Mm -hmm. was his headdress. Yeah, Mm -hmm. but I really miss him. He was like so connected. He was just so connected to the land and so connected to the earth and brought community together in a unique way. And it was just the community that everybody needed. I mean, it was like how awesome is a place just for men to go and feel safe and talk, you know, and share their problems and all that kind of and talk about herbs and their relationships and all that kind of stuff. It was pretty cool. The thing I remember most um, <laughs> stood out in my mind was this, there's this pond. Yes. With this, so, oh, my, I'm, at, I'm at Ann Walker. She also visited with this, I don't know, was it a live or dead um, uh, like raccoon? that they It was a live through? raccoon. So he did dog races too. So yeah. Beside the dog, beside the dance barn was a big pond and um, up on the bank, it had um, a cable that went from one side of the pond all the way to the other side of the pond. And then they had two boxes and and hunters (laughs) from all over the southeast would come and camp out in his fields and he would charge them like you know you got to pay me twenty dollars a night to camp out my field and you have to pay the enter the dog races so this is kind of (laughs) and and hazel dean his wife sold hamburgers hot dogs and cokes to the to the crew right and um so they would put dogs a dog in each one of the boxes and then the raccoon was way up high in a cage and this is a pet raccoon and and then they would release the cable you know kind of like somebody's winding release the cable they'd release the dogs and the dogs would jump in the water and start swimming and the raccoon would be sitting up there and totally safe and the raccoon would be going i'm so bored Uh, And look down and like fling things at the dogs. (laughs) It was like the raccoon was in total control. (laughs) It was it was funny. It was amazing. And yes, yeah, I'm glad you remember that. It was that was unique. 
<laughs> yeah, I never <laughs> said anything anywhere like that. Yeah. But, <laughs> okay. Actually, at Christmas time, we'll put up uh, the. It would be two years ago that um, uh, my dad did a uh, um, talk Kansas boyhood dog stories, and he tells a story about a like a special kind of uh, what is something healer or some kind of blue healer. Yeah, that would go after coons. That was coon hunting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This was the best of all possible blue healers. Yeah. Yeah, blue healer. They're good hunting dogs. My other grandfather raised hunting dogs, and he was called Doc Bright. His last name was Bright, and he was called Doc Bright because he was the herb doctor to the animals. This is on my mother's side, Doc Bright. And I used to go around with him to take care of the dogs because he he specialized in dogs and horses and mules. And so I would go around with him, you know, to take care of the animals. So I learned some herbal stuff there, too. Thanks for joining us. If you are interested in learning more, you can visit our website at MatthewWoodInstituteOfHerbalism.com. You can find all of our social links in the description below. Also, please subscribe to our channel so you can keep up with the latest videos.